In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful and gracious God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have gone our own way and have not followed the way of Christ Jesus, your Son. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, we have ignored our neighbor in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in the way of Christ again. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Benevolent God, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <laughs> The first reading comes from Ecclesiastics 1, chapter 1. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see all is vanity and a chasing, chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to
The second reading is from Galatians, the third chapter. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is in your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. <clears throat> In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythia, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. that I just read talked about a farmer who had such a large harvest and he already had a lot of crops and a lot of stuff that he didn't know what he was going to do. And so he decided that he was going to build bigger barns to store all that he had. 
And that's kind of interesting because he has so much and he's only one person, I guess. Um, it never seems to occur to him that maybe he could share, did it? He wasn't really thinking about, he wasn't thinking about whether he could share. And he didn't even, he didn't even ask God what to do, did he? God's really our first go-to person, right? When, we're have, when we have a question and we're not sure, well, what do we do in this situation? What do you want me to do? What, sh what, what can I do? So he doesn't ask God, and he doesn't ask anybody else that lives in the community. He just asks himself. And so he's like, he asks himself, well, what do we do? We build, a, we just build a bigger barn so we can get all this, all the crops and all the stuff there. Um, so he kept, he keeps his grain, which obviously that's food. So he needed to keep food, right? But he had so much, some of that grain he could keep for himself. So he has, that is a necessity. That's what he needs. But he turns the, the quantity, it's like that I just want to keep all of it. But he needs some, but he could give some away. And so um, all of us, there are ways that all of us can share what we have, right? It, and sometimes it doesn't, we don't, we don't have to share everything, but we can share something. And I was looking at the children's bulletin and it talks about, talking about how, sh how we share through our offering. And I bet it's just pretty, it's pretty incredible because where our offerings go, we give the money and sometimes we don't ever see it, right? But it goes so many places for world hunger. It's money comes to people in our country for food pantries and food banks all over the place. It goes to the continent of Africa. It goes to Central America. It goes to the Middle East. The money that we contribute goes everywhere to help feed people. And some of our some of the monies we have even goes to stays at Hatfield. So there are people all over the world who, because we share, have food. And we do often things with through world relief, um, <coughs> with with health kits and, and with school kits sometimes. And there's backpacks that are going to be happening from here. So being Sharing and caring for other people really are the, is part of what God asks us to do, isn't it? So all, all of the, the money we give goes all over in many, many places. It comes to our country, but it goes all over the world. And thousands and thousands of people's lives are touched by what we give. And, and we put we put our our offering, and when we put it with other people's, it starts to grow, and can do amazing things. And so I think part part of the um, part of the thought today is, and the question I'm going to try to answer in a little bit is, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? to be rich toward God. And certainly, one of the ways we are rich toward God is because we, we show our love for God by, by, by our giving and our sharing, right? Both of ourselves, our time and our possessions. So anyway, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I know we've heard it more than once. How many times do you think Jesus has said things like, take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It's amazing that very often Jesus talks about wealth and possessions. And I think that's because the surrounding culture in which human beings live places an exceedingly high value on the ability to have wealth and to acquire an abundance of possessions. One example for us of this was kind of a catchy slogan from a good while ago. It appeared on a lot of bumper stickers. At least that's where I first saw it. But apparently it was on t-shirts. And this, this, this slogan was, he or she who dies with the most toys wins. Wow. This attitude really flies in the face of Jesus' warning. Our text shows us no, that no matter when we live, this temptation to greed and the accumulation of wealth and possessions as the focus and priority of our life has always been present. This temptation was addressed in the 19th century in a popular book by Charles Dickens, that famous work entitled A Christmas Carol. We all remember the character of Ebenezer Scrooge, don't we? The, he's like the man in the parable whose life was focused on the accumulation of wealth and possessions. He didn't care about his family, he grasped about his employee, and Scrooge was not rich toward God, and neither did he acknowledge God. He cared only about himself, as does the farmer in the parable. He was wealthy and prosperous. He had so much, he had so much, he had to figure out how to store all the crops and goods you would think he might seek God's counsel, but he does not. He may not pray at all. He doesn't seek God's counsel, and he doesn't give thanks for the abundant harvest and all that he has received. His behavior leads me to believe that he thinks his success and his abundance of possessions comes from his ability of his own creation. He does not acknowledge that God is responsible for anything. He ignores God, and it's as though God doesn't even exist. This man doesn't consult with the other farmers to see what they think. He doesn't regard them either. Nor does he stop to think about how this decision may affect the rest of his community. It does not seem to matter to him if the other farmers may be impacted. He only focuses on himself and what is in his best interest. And that becomes underscored when he speaks only to himself about the solution to the storage dilemma. Tearing down the old barns and building larger ones is the best plan. Now he's set for life. He has made it big. He can eat, drink, and be merry without a care in the world. Life is great. There is, however, one unexpected glitch which really should not be so unexpected. He is to die. So there will be no endless eating, drinking, and being merry for years on end. His life is required of him at that moment. 
And is it any wonder that the writer of Ecclesiastes calls toiling under the sun and accumulating wealth as vanity and chasing after wind, especially when one spends their whole life focused on only storing up treasures on earth and is not rich toward God. Now please understand, God does not despise wealth or possessions or those who acquire things. What concerns God is greed. Greed is idolatry. Worshiping and loving what is important to you. Putting money and possessions before God. This is idolatry. And so this parable puts us on notice for us to take care. So we will be on guard against all kinds of greed. We know firsthand how much the culture in which we live encourages and tempts us to put our trust in treasure that is on earth and not so that we will be rich toward God. So what might it mean to be rich toward God? Well, first, I think we need to acknowledge God and broadcast loud and clear that we belong to God and that we are in relationship with God. But this isn't a relationship we started. This is a relationship that God initiated and invited us into, expressing his love and care for us through Christ Jesus his son. For through Christ, we accepted God's love and his adoption of us, of God's own and beloved people. Our baptism united us with Jesus, his death and resurrection. And our sin was drowned as we were joined to Jesus' death. And as Colossians reminds us too, we have been raised with him to new and eternal life. And that new eternal life has already started because God, in, in Christ, God's kingdom has broken into the world. And to have received all these gifts with God in new life and to respond with joy and love is what it means in part to be rich toward God. In gratitude and grace, God is first in our lives. We don't ignore God or disdain God. We love God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. For God first loved us, even while we were sinners, St. Paul reminds us. As God's beloved ones, we put to death what is earthly each and every time we confess our sins. Then we start anew to express our love for God as we seek to love who and what God loves. That means loving our neighbor as Jesus has taught us by his own example of life and ministry. For we seek the things that are above where he is. Second, we are rich toward God when we love our neighbor as ourselves. Fulfilling the second part of that commandment after loving God. So we love our neighbors near and far. But we don't just love them abstractly. We love them the way we want to be loved. We don't want to be ignored, so we don't ignore others. We don't like when people discount us, so we don't discount our neighbor. We, it just makes us upset if someone looks down on us 
and we don't look down on our neighbor. I really don't like being told who I am as a Lutheran Christian. People stereotype us. We can't stereotype our neighbor. Don't you hate being rejected? We don't reject our neighbor. But we all love acceptance. And so we accept our neighbor for who they are. And we all love to be warmly welcomed. And so we welcome. Acknowledging us makes us feel good. And so we acknowledge our neighbor. We all want to be listened to. And so we listen to our neighbor. And when we tell you our story, we all want to be believed. And so we believe our neighbor when they speak to us. You and I give the treatment to our neighbor that we want to receive. And loving our neighbor also may mean helping them when they are in need. Jesus only in two instances asked people to give away all they had. He doesn't expect the rest of us to give away everything, but to be as generous as possible, remembering that all that we have belongs to God. At times, our giving doesn't have to be huge to be helpful. There are even times when the best gift we can give our neighbor does not involve money or possessions, but is the gift of ourselves and our time. Being rich toward God, I really believe, is to be rich in love. Loving God, loving God's word, loving our neighbor as ourselves. You and I have put to death what is earthly, what God despises. And by God's grace, our life is with Christ, for he is in all is in all and in all, all of us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
let us confess the faith of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. O oh God, you are wholeness. Where there is division in your church, bring reconciliation and healing. Guide the works of theologians, Sunday school teachers, seminary professors, and all who provide instruction for the building up of your church. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you are the source of all life. Where creation cries out in distress, bring relief and renewal. Bless farmers, ranchers, distributors, and all who provide our food. Nourish the land and all its inhabitants. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you are the wisdom, so bring healing to the nations. Where nations and communities yearn for peace, bring justice. Strengthen those who toil for the welfare of others, especially military personnel, police, first responders, and activists. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. O oh God, you are life. Where your people are overwhelmed with the busyness of life, bring encouragement. Accompany all who experience emotional, mental, and physical distress. Renew us at your table of mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God of grace and mercy, we pray for your presence and your healing to come to all who suffer illness, especially Jared Atkins, Linda and Doug Stoner, Jessica Kirshner, Lee Manifold, Ed Irwin, Karen Chesters, Mary Chesters, Shirley Groff, Flo Pro K, and Harlan Red K. Strengthen them in body and spirit. Also comfort the families of Pauline Eanes and J. Donald Schaefer with the promise of new and eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Merciful God. Yes. Oh God, you are our treasure. Where scarcity and anxiety pervade your church, bring abundance and vitality. Guide the work of church councils and committees and give them clarity for the work of ministry in this place. Merciful God. O oh God, you are resurrection. We give you thanks for all your saints. Inspire us by their example of faithful living to set our minds on things above and to be rich in love toward you. Merciful God, receive, our receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs>
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift of, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.